From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome inside the ICE house. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Blue jeans. It's been a symbol of our culture for over a century and a half. And what many link to the California gold rush actually harkens back to a classic story of immigration. You see, Levi Strauss and company made the first blue jean in 1873, but Levi Strauss, the inventor, or entrepreneur as we might call him today, wasn't born here. Butenheim, Bavaria was his place of birth back in 1829. After immigrating to New York in 1848, Levi joined his two older brothers who'd arrived in the U.S. before him to work for their family's dry goods business. And in 1853, Levi headed west to San Francisco, not to make his fortune panning for gold, but to set up his own dry goods business and represent West Coast operations for the family firm. One of my favorite TV shows ever was David Milch's Deadwood on HBO. It tells the story of gold prospectors in South Dakota. Two of the most compelling characters in that show were Seth Bullock and Saul Starr, who together started Starr and Bullock Hardware. Modeled on real-life characters, Star, too, was born in Bavaria, and you can imagine Strauss's heirs feeling a particular kinship with the Deadwood dry goods entrepreneurs, reaching for their dreams not with nuggets of gold, but purveying the supplies needed to do the hard work in the rivers, streams, and mines. In these pursuits, you need to be particularly tied to your customers' aspirations, and in 1872, Levi Strauss got a letter from one of them, Jacob Davis, a Nevada tailor who'd purchased denim cloth from Levi's company to make work pants. Frustrated by constant tears in the pants, Davis created a new way to ensure the clothing's longevity by using copper rivets to reinforce the pant seams. He was looking for a business partner to help patent his idea, and the rest, you might say, is history. The patent for fastening pocket openings was granted to Jacob Davis and Levi Strauss and Company on May 20th, 1873, marking the birth of the first blue jeans. What began as clothing for industrial labor is today over a $16 billion industry in the U.S. alone. Betting on casual wear. It's what millions of consumers opt to wear after work and on weekends, whether it's your average Joe or even the president of the United States. You know me, I'm a student of presidential history. Photos of President Ronald Reagan at his California ranch sporting denim and a straw hat while brushing his horses are a part of the indelible pictures of my younger days. Where you don't typically see denim is on Wall Street. Until now, that is. Where suits may still reign supreme, some of the nation's most powerful financial institutions have recently announced a loosening of dress codes. And just a few weeks ago, Goldman Sachs, one of the bluest of blue chip firms, issued an internal memo this month announcing a new firm-wide flexible dress code, and J.P. Morgan went business casual nearly two years ago. You might not see investment bankers doing deals in denim just yet, but perhaps we're on our way. The trading floor here at the New York Stock Exchange, however, still requires a traditional dress code. No t-shirts, jeans, or sneakers are permitted. But this morning was a different scene. As Levi Strauss & Co. rang the opening bell and its initial public offering got underway, now trading as NYSE ticker symbol Levi, the Levi Strauss executive team was greeted by a sea of blue as our traders and staff donned Levi's jeans and denim jackets to welcome the company to the New York Stock Exchange. I'm wearing my new pair of 502s and Levi's trucker jacket as I sit here in the library and proudly cheering on the opening bell as it rang was Harmeet Singh, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Levi Strauss. Like Levi's, Harmeet's path to the bell podium has also been one of immigration, sharp business acumen, and financial prowess. How did he find himself at the helm of one of the oldest and most iconic American retailers, What do his responsibilities entail in overseeing the company's financial growth? And what lies ahead for the future of retail? We'll find out right after this. 
Tencent Music Entertainment Group is the largest online music entertainment group in China. We operate the four largest online music apps, including the social entertainment part. We are serving more than 800 million users. The user experience on TMD platform is extremely great. I look forward to have a long-term partnership with New York Stock Exchange. Tencent Music Entertainment Group is now listed on New York Stock Exchange. Joining us, denim clad in the Ice House today, is Harmeet Singh, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Levi Strauss. When it comes to IPOs, this isn't Harmeet's first rodeo, or should I say, road show. Prior to joining Levi in 2013, Harmeet served as the CFO of Hyatt Hotels Corporation, NYSE ticker symbol H, where he established a global financial structure, took the company public, and created a strong balance sheet. He's also held executive financial roles for global corporations, including Yum Brands, American Express India, and Price Waterhouse India. Harmeet, welcome to the Ice House. Thanks for having me, Josh. The first question I have is, where do I score one of those shearling collared jackets that you have? Yeah, you know, you can get that at our Times Quest uh, store. We opened that a couple of months ago. We, you can get it in any one of our stores in New York. We have one in Soho House, or you can get it online. Uh, and Levi's.com. You look particularly dashing at the trading post today with you and Chip Berg ringing the first bell there. And I watched, you know, from afar, but embraces, hugs, high fives all around. What was going through your head at this moment? It was exciting. And I must thank our employees around the world for allowing us to get to this part. Our shareholders, our, you know, our family shareholders who've been with the company now for over 160 years, and a wonderful board. You know, when we, when Chip and I joined the company, um, you know, a little over six, seven years ago, it was a very different company. It was not as diversified. The company then was skewed towards U.S., skewed towards wholesale, and skewed towards men's bottoms. And if you summed it up, it said low single-digit growth. The company today is a lot more diversified, a lot more global, international. Today is 54% of our business, and the U.S. is growing. Our direct-to-consumer business, where you can actually shop Times Square, Soho, our stores, as well as online, is about a third of our business, and it's been growing in the low double digit. I went in there the other day, bought this getup, a great I, service, loved the whole experience. Yeah, and uh, in today, you can buy t-shirts, you can buy woven shirts like I'm wearing. You know, women can go and buy their product, um, you know, we're by a, a mile we are market leaders in both men's and women's in denim around the world and both businesses are growing so you know it's it, uh, all in all an epic day that sets us up you know and the enterprise for another 165 years the shares price last night at $17 they opened at 2222 have you and chip taken a minute just to sit back and reflect on it you know uh, not uh, at all because we don't look at stock price on a uh, you know by minute basis we don't look at it on a daily basis we along with our board and both new shareholders and our older shareholders uh, you know want to grow this company for the long term and uh, what's more important is what does the stock price do over time as against on a particular moment of time or a particular day I was down at the trading post for a while this morning watching price discovery, and you've seen this process unfold before, but what did you see, feel, and hear today that was different from your prior experiences? Yeah, it, uh, it took longer, and I think it's a good testimony to the demand out there. I would have thought with technology, a lot more technology today than that existed 10 years ago, it would have taken uh, less time, but it was brilliant. Uh, you know, they were able to price it at different levels, see the demand and supply instantaneously, which didn't exist a decade ago. And uh, I think the other big difference was having everybody wearing denim and our product, which didn't exist 10 years ago. So a totally different they experience. They weren't wearing hotel rooms. <laughs> yeah, no hotel rooms. And, you know, so it's a very different experience. Uh, but, you know, I'm proud. I, I was saying this to uh, somebody earlier, just lucky and Privileged and proud to be associated with two iconic brands that went public. CNBC's Bob Pisani was in the middle of the action during price discovery. Let's listen to Bob and Patrick Murphy, the head of the NYSE Market Making and Listing Services at GTS, on what makes the process of price discovery so unique. 
Really getting close, genuinely. 21.75 to 22 and a quarter. And folks, when you get a 50 cent spread, that means we're really, really close. Come on, let's get big man with the answers here. Patty, when's it happen? We're getting very close. Uh, we're fine tuning the price. Um, it's a little bit above five dollars on the range. It's uh, we got plenty of volume, um, so it's, it's very close. All systems go. How do you decide when you cut it off? You're talking to the guest, the desk over at Goldman. You're trying to figure out what the right price is. When do you say, okay, guys, enough? The book is closed. How do you make that decision? Basically, when the price pairs off with the buyers and sellers, and we're very comfortable with the depth of book on both sides of the market, um, applying our technology. We feel comfortable. The desk at Goldman feels comfortable. All the asset managers and the brokers feel comfortable. I, we're almost to that point right now. And this is a dynamic process. We always keep explaining to people. It, 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 there are people at the last second. You say, "Okay, we're ready," and then somebody comes in with a, with a new with a new bid, and it moves. Correct. And that's why this process is great. We take our time. Not only do we apply technology, but the human element of Greg, uh, Glenn and Mike. We make sure that everybody has a chance for the print, full transparency on price and volume, and uh, you know we're very close. So that was the way it unfolded this morning, Harmeet. But this is the, really the culmination of, I don't know how long your roadshow actually was, but do you have any energy left to like look over Patrick's shoulder and watch the price get balanced? Yeah, no, it's, it was a lot of energy, a lot of excitement. You know, for a lot of people, it was the first time. For me, obviously, it was the second time, but in a very different environment. And it's always exciting to see, you know, the interest in the company. And that's what I was seeing. How many people want to buy? How many people want to sell? and seeing the demand supply into play and uh, you know, drive the stock price. Uh, so it was, it was great. And Bob was patient because he kept coming back after, uh, you know, after every half an hour just to say, okay, is it ready or not? And it's wonderful to see the uh, demand drive you know, the final supply. I watched your comments this morning in the boardroom to your team. You said that through the whole process, you underestimated a lot. You're in the business of making rock solid estimations. What did you underestimate? I underestimated and you know, I should have prefaced that by saying I'm pretty good at forecasting. And if I'm wrong, I'd rather, I'd rather be wrong in terms of under committing, you know, versus over committing. And that's what I was wrong here. I think a couple of things. Uh, one was I underestimated the strength and the secret sauce of Levi's in terms of his culture. We're a very value-based organization. We want to grow the uh, business for the long term. Growing profits through principles is important, which in essence means that, you know, making something is important, but how you do it, you know, the fact that it has to be sustainable, the fact that it is the right thing is, is critical. I underestimated the strength of our people. You know, there's a lot of pride in this company to be associated and work, you know, with the group. You can see it from... The, uh, the employees who came here, but what you didn't see today was the excitement around the world on our listing. Uh, we had folks in our home office, because we have deep roots in San Francisco, who were there at six o'clock in the morning. We had folks in Europe, and you know, it's, it's late there. You know, they were beaming in. There were folks in, in Asia who were just waking up. So a lot of excitement around the world. And I underestimated uh, the potential of this brand when all our cylinders are firing. In Europe, for example, last few years we've been growing at 20%. Uh, the European economies or the category grows at 2 or 3%, but we've been chugging along. In the U.S. last year we grew at 10%. And the you know, denim category is growing you know, at about 2%, and you know, our wholesale doors are closing. So there is a lot of potential in this brand if you get it right. And we're just beginning a lot of things. So to me, just seeing that is is great. And I keep telling our P, our, our employees, and I said that uh, this morning. I said, you know, if uh, let's prove the investors wrong by making sure they underestimate it and what they'll get from us. And to me, that's important. Uh, Undercommit, over deliver. But the strength of uh, people, our culture, and our business or our brands is uh, is great. I mean, at the same gathering, Chip said that the work over the last six or seven years came down to three things, brands, people, and progress. The work that you and Chip have done, as was discussed this morning, is to make Levi's great again. And it seems I've heard a phrase like that somewhere <laughs> before. What went into that? I tell people, and you know, this is something I've done all my life, especially the last two gigs at Hyatt and here. I didn't sign up, I didn't come here to sign up for a job. I came here to make a difference. And the difference was uh, to make uh, you know, Levi's and the other brands uh, great again, 
largely in ensuring that we are connecting with the consumer. We are doing more than just you know what we've done over the years, which is men's bottoms, and we're growing this business globally. And that's what making Levi's great again is important. Plus, our people. We have an obligation to a responsibility. You know, is is critical that they feel that we are winning, and we're here and we uh, for a long time, and we'll w- continue to win for a long time. And getting that confidence back, which probably had disappeared six, seven years ago. I mean, there's a there's a saying that if the business results are not great or strong, the first thing that happens is you lose good people. And today, you know, I'm very proud that uh, we have the best of best. I mean, we'll, we are in the Silicon area, uh, Bay Area. There's a lot of, you know, heat for talent from that perspective. Uh, but we have uh, folks who have been here for a long time and will be here for a long time. Uh, two weeks ago, we, we, you know, once a year we get a top 250 leaders from around the world and just talk about the business. And we got that group two weeks ago. And a large majority of them, you know, came a year ago. You know, so their folks have been here for a while, you know, believe in the company. And, uh, you know, we believe it'll stay for a long, long time. You joined Levi's at the start of this financial turnaround that included turning a free cash flow from a negative 158 million to almost 300 million positive in 2017. When I was at First Data, the turnaround in free cash was this prime litmus test about the company's readiness to have an IPO, but the timing needed to be just right. Why is 2019 the right time to tap the public markets? Yeah, three reasons. Uh, One, we have had strong business results. We are confident about our future and our business results and delivering what we said for a long, long time. So that's one. Second, um, the management team that got us here, helped in the turnaround, is the management team that will take it to the next level. So there's stability plus, you know, a group that knows the business well. And uh, last but not the least, the markets are are at the right spot. The markets are hot, our brands are hot, so from a timing perspective, is great. And as we think about building this enterprise for the next 165 years, and it has to be, it has to go beyond Chip and me or the management team. It has to be driven by a corporate structure, a set of shareholders who believe in the long-term orientation of the company, and that's why you know tapping long-term institutional shareholders who we can engage. And uh, you know, I'm a, I'm I'm a big believer that when you engage with people, it's a two-way street. Uh, you know, feedback to me is a gift, and uh, you know, I believe good shareholders don't hold back. They 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 tell you what's on their mind, and we can have that conversation, and together we can emerge as a much stronger group. And I think that's what uh, you know, tapping the public markets is gonna be all about. You were mentioning being in, in San Francisco, close to the technology heart of the world, really. San Francisco is going through a boom right now that rivals its growth during the gold rush that gave Levi's its start. We see names like Uber and Slack and Airbnb looking ahead to IPOs, but we also see ideas flame out dramatically in Silicon Valley, like all the stories that are coming out now from that ghost building that was once the headquarters of Theranos. Does being in one of the main innovation centers in the world influence Levi's recent development? Do the stories of success but also failure drive you to think of Levi's as a technology company that happens to make apparel, as Chip said in a recent podcast. We've talked about it. Are we, uh, you know, a company that has great brands that, and has technology that enables the brands to grow, or are we a technology company? I'd say we're a company that has great brands, but leverages or uses technology to grow those brands and grow our presence. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, you know, I look after technology for the company, so not only finance, I look after technology. When I got here six, seven years ago, because there was no business strategy, you know, we were just spending money on technology to run the trains. We were not using technology to grow the business. We, you know, e-commerce is a very small piece of, the, of our business today. You know, two thirds of our capital is to grow this business and technology plays a big role. The one thing that, you know, Chip has done a lot of great things, but the one thing that stands out to me is he brought the Innovation Center to San Francisco. It used to be in Turkey. And 80% of our innovation today or our relevance in products comes out of that Innovation Center. It's, It's less than a mile from our office. The latest innovation is something that I think 
and I strongly believe will take us to the next level, and that is FLX, is future-led execution. It is all about leveraging laser machines to finish genes. The lasers today can finish a gene in 90 seconds. Uh, it takes 20 minutes by hand in a third world or emerging country, so definitely margin accretive. But more importantly, we, because we've got some laser, laser units in our distribution center in Las Vegas, we can finish stuff closer to market, you know, closer to when the trend is. And I think that will drive sales, it'll ensure we are on trend most of the time. It'll ensure that we are able to chase trends that you know one hasn't predicted before, and will help us run our business with lower inventory and lower markdowns because you know t you know stuff that we're selling is largely stuff that's on trend. Harmeet, here is a clip from a three-part documentary presented by Levi's that celebrates the 501 Jeans influence on popular culture. I want to hear a clip from it and then get a thought from you on the other side. Another a rude boy, definitely a rockabilly, bro graffiti, hip hop culture, the 501, just fit any of them. Mods and rockers, beetle freaks, punks and skunks and kooks and geeks, which pretty much sums up Levi's. Emulating Patti Smith and the Ramones and people who were living like paupers in New York City. I inherited a pair when I was a kid. My brother was a suede head, like a two or number three skinhead. The uniform was Doc Martens and 501s. I had to hide them. Uh, I was on my way to rabbinical school and, and I wasn't supposed to be packing jeans with me. And they weren't necessarily wearing them for any other reason than they found them or some chick stole her boyfriend's pants. The 501s, the Australopithecus of cool jeans. The Australopithecus of cool jeans. I don't even know what that means, Harmeet, but everyone has their own Levi's story. What's yours? So my Levi's story, you know, dates back to the 80s. I spent more than half my life overseas. I went to school and grew up in India. And in the 1980s, India as an economy was not open to brands. So I had this aunt who was, you know, headed to the US and she asked me what, what I wanted. And I said, you know, like most kids at that point, I said, I want a pair of Levi's. And she said, all right, she'll get it. So she comes back, uh, has my pair of Levi's. I give her a call, she says, I've got it. And I waited for a week, it didn't show up. So I called her again and said, what happened? Well, she said, your cousin stole it because you know it was not something that he would part with at the moment he knew that I'd get it. It took me three months later to get a pair of Levi's, but that is what the product was. It was hot and it continues to be hot and it's something that one has grown up with and will always continue to wear. We are a democratic band, you know, all genders, all ages can wear our product, and these are relevant products. From the 1980s and your own personal Levi's story to 2019 and today, this week Instagram launched a new checkout featured on its mobile app, which allows users to store their own payment information within Instagram in order to make purchasing an item as easy as liking a photo. And in return, Instagram is going to charge retailers a selling fee, and 20 retailers have already signed on, including Nike, Adidas, Warby Parker, and Zara. Levi's currently has 5.7 million followers on Instagram, and hashtag Levi's has been mentioned in 4.7 million posts, a number which I'm sure is going to increase after today. Given Levi's strong presence on social media, would you consider selling through Instagram checkout, and does that fit within your financial strategy? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, it's um, an, another way of reaching out to the younger consumer. We have connected really well with the younger consumer over the years. The, the average age, you know, in terms of the men who use us has moved from 47 in the U.S. to about 32. The average age for women has moved from 39 to 34 over the last many years, and that's huge movement. So I think Instagram is a good way to connect, and you know, I've got, and I'll just go back, you know, in terms of my immediate family, I have a wife and daughter. You know, when I joined the company in 13, I said to my wife and daughter, it's time to connect back with Levi's. It took my wife two years to start supporting Levi's, and that's when we reset the women's business in 2015. My daughter connected back with the brand, not because the dad kept telling her, but because of all the cool products, you know, in 2017. And today they converts. And I think, oh, and that's the, that's the change that's happened as we've resurrected the brand. So to answer your question, yeah, I mean, it's something I'm sure Mark uh, Rosen, who's our director, consumer head, will definitely take a look at.
I recently visited the Levi's store in Soho where I noticed a few things. I was immediately drawn to the Levi's tailor station at the center of the store where customers can have custom patchwork or embroidery sewn into a denim jacket, studs added to your jeans, or simply altered for the best fit. What's the take up on this kind of customized setting? It's great. Everybody loves it, but especially the millennials. They love it. Our tailor sh- We had tailor shops in the past. But it was only until Europe, which has been on a complete tear, ensure that they were able to deliver choice because consumers want choice. The millennials love that choice. They started expanding tailor shops in all our mainline doors, and it really took off. It allows people to customize and personalize. We've introduced something called a print bar where we get blank tees, and then you can print you know, within a guideline of what you can print on the T-shirts, and that's taken off. So... As we are remodeling our stores or building new stores, we are adding tailor shops. And Soho, for example, was remodeled about 18 months ago. Soho was losing money. It was in a prime area, great traffic, Mm -hmm. but uh, not growing at the pace that we thought it should be growing. So that's what we did. We added the tailor shop, both print bar and the customization. We changed the fitting room experience. So we got a lot more fitting rooms. We, uh, We... Freshened the lighting, added more lighting, and uh, brought in a head-to-toe look because now we've got products on, in the top categories in, and in the bottom category and, and across both genders, and the business has taken off. So it now makes money, which I never thought it would, and that's great. Another interesting element about that store, this is a nod to your sustainability efforts. There's a water fountain that's affixed to the wall where customers can refill their reusable water bottles. Store associates walk around with iPads, allowing them to check inventory and check out a customer at the same spot. How is this reimagining and reinventing the in-store experiences help drive growth, a place to fill up your bottle? Thank you for bringing that up because, you know, we're big believers in doing the right thing, both for society as well as ensuring scarce resources are, you know, we protect those resources. And and that's why I think, you you know, you had the filling the bottles uh, optionality incorporated as we remodel the store. We're also looking at the store of the future. You know, so where does this go from here? And it's all about, and sustainability is a big piece, you know, reducing our carbon footprint, reducing the energy that you use in these stores, et cetera, is all areas of focus. So over time, you know, that's going to be important. You know, we've always, I think it was about a year ago, we voiced our views on, on climate and what are we going to do uh, relative to that. And we've come up with real targets that we believe we can meet over the next uh, four or five years. And as we finish up the, this part of the program, really focusing in on your role, achieving operational excellence, perhaps the most important part of the strategy was one that zeroed in on your world, Harmeet. Chip noted that Levi's needed to cut costs, drive cash flow, become more data-driven and financially disciplined. Since launching this strategy, you've paid down nearly a billion dollars in debt, and you've got $1.2 billion in liquidity. Explain the steps you took to make this happen. Sure. So when I got here about six years, seven years ago, Chip and I were talking and say, okay, Armid, you've got to write this organ- organization announcement, and so what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do two things. I want people to remember me with somebody, as someone who came in and unlocked significant shareholder value and obviously strengthened the financial position of the company. At that time, the balance sheet was uh, over-levered. Uh, we were levered over three and a half times. Uh, we were not investing for growth, and that was a problem. Balance sheet, as I tell people, was a constraint. You know, you had your hands tied around your back, and I said, that's not going to be the company that I a, want to be associated with, but more importantly, the legacy I want to leave. So what we did then, uh, we spent 13 and 14 taking a hard look at our cost base. We took out about 10% of management headcount. We shut two factories. We took services that we don't need to be best in class and outsourced that because that was not a core competency. And we unlocked probably $200 million a year. So we had two choices. We could bank it and, you know, our margins, operating margins would be in the mid-teens. Everybody would say, oh, my God, that's pretty good. Or we could invest a large part of it to grow and restructure this company. We took the second choice because we are here for the long term. And that has allowed us now to develop what I call a cash generation machine in terms of a business where it becomes a bit of a flywheel, okay? You generate a lot of cash, you can invest that cash or drop it to your bottom line, and you can then grow this business 
and more importantly, differentiate ourselves with the rest of the world around here. And that's what we've been doing. After the break, we discuss Harmeet Singh's path to San Francisco and why sustainability is critical to a company's financial growth. That's right after this. Twilio is a cloud communications platform that allows software developers to embed any kind of communications into every software application they build. We see ourselves at day one of a future of communications, which is powered by software. And so we are going to continue to build out globally more ways of communicating. The New York Stock Exchange is a critical part of our global economy. It's amazing for a company to get to be a part of that long tradition. Twilio is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Welcome back. Before the break, Harmeet Singh, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Levi Strauss and Company, broke down his company's financial strategy and outlook following its initial public offering, which happened on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange this very day. Harmeet, like Levi Strauss, you were also an immigrant to the United States. You studied business in Delhi at Sri Ram College of Commerce, and after graduating, began working for Price Waterhouse India in auditing and accounting. What spurred you to get into business? Was this a family orientation? No, actually not. So when I um, did my char- chartered accountancy in India uh, with Pricewaterhouse, I had a, my objective was to set up my own consulting firm, my own audit firm. But then I met my current wife, fell in love. You know, my dad said to me one day, he saw this wonderful advertisement from American Express. He said they're looking for financial analysts. They were paying at that point the highest paid starting salary for a financial analyst in the country, which was in today's dollar terms about $400 a year. And he said, why don't you apply? You're starting a life, you know, doing something on your own will take a little time. I said, okay, let me give it a shot. So I drummed up a resume, uh, went to submit it to American Express uh, on my way to Price for the House. And uh, so I walked in. Dropped my res- uh, resume with the receptionist. She turned around and said, do you have 30 minutes? I said, I can. She said, could you meet the HR officer? So I met the HR officer. Well, long story short, uh, about 13 interviews later, they said, you got to meet the CEO. And I said, it's about 5 o'clock. And my dad was buying me my first uh, car. And the dealership closed at 7 o'clock. So I said to them, listen, I didn't come here for a job. I have to go and pick up my car, and uh, I can come and meet the CEO at 7, 7.30, and they said, let's do it. So I went, picked up my car, came back, met the CEO. At 8.30, they gave me an offer letter and said, "You got, we want you here. And that started my career with great brands, American Express at that point. And then when I was with American Express, I was there for about eight years. Pepsi decided it's time to enter India, and they said, let's set up the young business, KFC yeah. and Pizza Hut. So an old boss of mine, you know, was the managing director. He said, Harmeet, I want you as a CFO. And by the way, Harmeet, we don't have a company yet. We've got to form a company. So I said, all right. My wife was expecting our first child. She was not really comfortable me switching, but, you know, I took the risk. I switched. We set up the business. It took off. And then uh, Pepsi brought me to uh, Singapore as the Asia CFO. We think about these young brands, including KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, And when I travel abroad, you know, you see as many of those brands and storefronts in Mumbai, Tokyo, and Beijing as you do in L.A., Boston, and Dallas. What particularly allowed that category of brand to flourish so well in so many other countries around the world? Yeah, I think it comes down to the product. If you were offering the right product, and whether it's KFC, you know, the Asians love chicken, or it's Pizza Hut, they love, you know, Pizza Hut. I think that makes a big difference. And then obviously in the restaurant business, it is uh, making sure you provide the right experience and you have you know, restaurants all over the place. Like, so I think, like Levi's, was there a little bit of America too when you walked in those yeah, doors? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I had franchisees line up to be associated with uh, an American brand. There is the American brand Halo. And I've been lucky in my career to be associated with large global, you know, American initiated brands. And I tell people, because I speak to students all the time, and say, okay, Harmeet, how do you get here? First, I said, I didn't grow up thinking I'll be CFO of two large companies and taking two companies public. It just happened. You know, what I tell people is, you know, one of the three things you should think about is be associated with global brands, global consumer brands, because even though they're large companies, you learn a lot. And the cultures are phenomenal. So if you're good, you tend to progress and progress fast. I mean, Chip was saying on CNBC today that 
I think a question was put to him, is there any sort of brand drag now on Levi's because of America's place in the world today? But the answer that Chip gave really was that Levi's speaks today as it always has for everything that's great about America. Yeah, I say this really with confidence. There are very few people I've met who don't have a Levi's story. Uh, you know, when we were in the roadshow, we met a lot of different investors. I remember this, uh, the doorman in one of the hotels we were staying in, and he says, I've got 25th pair of Levi's. Okay, I've told my wife, when I die, okay, I want to be buried with a pair of Levi's. And there are s stories like that all over the world, and I think that's largely because it's a great brand, products are great. We, we're a very democratic brand. We play across all categories of uh, consumers, and that's huge. So you went from the restaurant and franchise industry and later into the hospitality industry, chief financial officer of Hyatt Hotel Group. Did your experience in these industries translate into retail? I mean, from the hotel room business into the apparel business? Yeah, no, the, uh, and I tell, I tell folks that other than this job, I've never done a job I've done before. Uh, you know, I was CFO at Hyatt, I was CFO here, but difference, I was in different industries. My career has probably transgressed around four or five industries. My daughter says to me, that you've uh, worked in the basic industries, food, shelter, if you take Hyatt, providing shelter and clothing. I really love harnessing and getting different experiences. And that's just been my career. I've you know, worked in three, four countries, six, seven cities, and four or five industries. And I, you know, it's important because I also like to play out of my comfort zone. I was doing very well at uh, YAM, and I had no reason to leave. I had under a call and said, we'd like you to be CFO at Hyatt, and I said to the headhunter, I said, you got the wrong person. Number one, I've never been in hospitality. Number two, I've never taken a company public. And they said, no, we think you're the right guy for mm. these reasons. And six months later, I was working at Hyatt. The same thing happened when Chip called me uh, and said, we'd like you to join um, Levi's. I said, that's great, but apparel is not off my sleeve. And he said, I'm not a apparel guy too, let's do it together. And I said, okay, that makes sense, let's try it. And that's been my whole journey. Uh, you know, play out of your comfort zone, learn, you know, associate yourself with great brands and the rest will happen automatically. We were talking earlier about the efforts from Levi's to be a more sustainable company. You launched the Water Less process in 2011, reducing the amount of water used in the finishing process of producing denim. Last summer, Levi's announced yet another sustainability plan focused on cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 40% in your supply chain by 2025. Will implementing these energy efficiency programs have a direct impact on your financial growth? Yeah, it will. You know, a couple of years ago, someone said to me, this is Levi's. One of the values is pro growing profit through principles. And I said, that's important. But as a CFO, my role is to be able to, A, set the right tone on the top because I'm joining a company that has profitable principles. I've got to be convinced and, more importantly, drive that across the organization. And second is demonstrate to people that really creates value. The waterless program creates value because you're not reaching out to a consumer set, largely the millennials who really believe in sustainability. You know, using less water is you know, less expensive. The margins are more accretive. I think the margins were up a couple of basis points. In terms of, you know, we have a workers' well-being program. Now we cover about 200,000 workers mm. across 10 countries. This is largely focused on women in, in, in emerging countries, driving financial literacy as well as health. And what we have proved is that for every dollar that's invested, the return is about four times that because it drives higher productivity, largely because of lower absenteeism, et cetera, and more connection to the uh, to our vendors. So clear opportunity. We just uh, announced, I think not just about a year ago, we announced FLX. Mm -hmm. It started as a sustainability program, but it's about leveraging through our own software laser machines to finish our genes as against manual labor, which takes 20 minutes. Laser machines take 90 seconds. And we're pioneering that across the industry. You know, we've filed 29 patents, uh, got about nine approved. In essence, uh, you know, we believe this beside reducing the number of chemicals, I think we'd, uh, we were using thousands of chemicals, we're down to uh, two dozen. It is also will allow us to compete better in the marketplace because we're able to chase trends. And importantly, it's accretive financially because it's higher gross margin will lead to lower inventory and lower markdown. So, 
you know, I think the combination, going back to my earlier point, the magic of the end, you know, you all have to do something that is important to you, but also, you know, is rewarding to our shareholders longer term. The magic of the end, the power of the brand, the company even made ESG part of its celebration of winning the naming rights to the 49ers' new stadium. Let's take a listen. When the company claimed naming rights to the San Francisco 49ers' new billion-dollar home in Santa Clara, California last year, the Field of Dreams nickname was born. Levi's trademarked the term and made the play on words a reality this month with a Bay Area denim drive that brought in over 18,850 pairs. The donated jeans, whose sale at Goodwill will benefit the nonprofit's local job training programs, ended up at Levi's Stadium to demonstrate the impact of recycling used clothing instead of sending it to the land. And Phil. Now, Harmeet, I've been part of a lot of public companies. I've known a bunch of CFOs, and I've been pitched a lot of naming rights opportunities, and that usually gets a veto immediately when it goes to the CFO's office. Levi's Stadium, how's it done for the brand and, and the company? Yeah, no, it's done great. You know, I was a week in the company, and I joined a company that was over-levered, you know, cost structure was high, when Chip walks into my door, he says, I have a great idea. I said, what's your idea? He said, I'm going to spend $200 million <laughs> uh, over 20 years and is to, uh, you know, brand or get the naming rights for the new stadium. And I've got that wonderful experience with the Gillette Stadium in Boston and it's yeah. been successful. And I said, Chip, you know, that's your experience. You know, I uh, when I was CFO at Pizza Hut in Dallas, Pizza Hut took the naming rights of a soccer stadium in Dallas. It was a disaster. All right, so let's do this. Let's pitch your your positive experience with my negative experience, and let's come up with something that things work. And we came up with a, a financial equation that worked for the company because I, I strongly believe that the best way to ensure that the dollar that you spend gets the best right is, are you connecting with the consumer? Everybody goes to watch a game of football, wears, most of them wear, wear jeans, mm -hmm. and that's a, and they are our consumer set, so that was a win. At that time, the 49ers were doing well, and you know, I'm sure they'll, they'll cut back. And as we thought about this over 20 years, it was clear to us that the stadium would get a couple of Super Bowls. We didn't realize if, you know, it would get in two years from when we named it, mm -hmm. and you know, as you know today, Every ad on the Super Bowl is about $5 million, and here we had the branding, so it was a clear payback. And the only other thing I said to Chip is, you know, let's not, uh, the money we spend, let's ensure it's not incremental. Let's try and find this for something else we, we did, and he agreed, and the rest is history. So, you know, it really works. For every dollar that we've invested, the payback is huge. The branding is just unbelievable. If you haven't been to the stadium, the next time you guys are there, we'll take you. I was reading when you are interviewing candidates for a position at Levi Strauss, you often like to ask them a question relating to the company's values of empathy, integrity, originality, and courage. Where does this stem from? Is this between you and Chip, empathy and courage? No, it's actually something that we inherited. The founders of the company brought the values to bear. The values are what differentiate us from others. The values have stuck around for 160 years, in good times and bad times. And it resonated with us individually. If you think about us as leaders, those principles or values are important to each one of us. And I think that's why... Was this question asked of you? Not as direct, but in the questions that uh, you know Chip and I talked about or the board talked about, in some form of, of fashion, integrity came up you know, what you've done from a courage perspective came up, originality, you know, are you innovative or not? What have you done from a courage perspective? I think, you know, playing out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Done that all my life. I, I've taken a company public when I hadn't taken a company public before. I've not been educated in the U.S., but I've still been successful in the U.S. I've gone across four industries, and, you know, I learned through that. So, you know, I love that. I mean, I love the experience. I worked with people I hadn't worked before and been successful and made sure... The, the people I lead are successful. What I really feel good about is when people who work for me go on and do bigger, better roles, and I've got enough examples of that. Well, this is your first day of trading, my friend, and before too long, I'm sure I'll be dialing up and listening to your first quarterly earnings call as a public company. The journey begins here. Thank you so much for taking a little detour into the ice house and spending some time with us. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me here. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Harmeet Singh. 
Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Levi Strauss and Company. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash and Teresa DeLuca with production assistance from Ken Abel. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 